Hey guys, today we have a huge 12 volt, 460 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery from Vatra for review. That is nearly 6,000 watt hours of stored energy. This battery takes the place as the largest 12 volt lithium iron phosphate battery that we have reviewed on this channel thus far. Now, this is the fourth battery we will be reviewing from them and we've had a bit of trouble with them in the past. This model is fairly new to the market and I can tell the company has come a long way, so I'm hopeful that any concerns of inadequacy have been resolved. Additionally, I've received a lot of viewer feedback from people who have these batteries from Vatwer and they are all very happy with them. Before we get started, you'll notice I have a new workbench here behind me, uh, better suited for filming, and it's my hope that we'll be doing more work here versus out in the garage. A large portion of that work will be server and IT related content, so if you're not already following my other channel, Home Sysadmin, head on over and hit that subscribe button. All right, so let's get down to business. We're going to do a quick look at the physical characteristics of this battery, we'll run a capacity test, and then we'll tear it apart to see how it's built inside. This battery measures 19 inches by 10 inches by 11 inches, and it weighs in at 108 pounds. It's quite a heavy battery. Both sides of the battery has some very basic information, some warnings. It is a 12.8 volt, that's the nominal voltage battery. And additionally, we have some air vents on both sides. I don't think we've seen air vents on any of the batteries so far. Taking a look at the top of this battery, we have two heavy duty retractable foldable handles here for carrying. On the left hand side here, we have our terminals, obviously red is positive and black is negative. These covers are held on with two Phillips screws and then we have our M8 terminal stud here. And these studs come with a flat washer, a split lock washer, and a, uh, I think that was a 13 or a 14 millimeter nut. And something very unique about this battery is that we have a hydrometer and a thermometer built into the top and it's actually very nice looking. I don't know how accurate this actually is. I assume it's reading the inside of the battery because you see it shows 60% humidity and what's that, about 13 degrees Celsius. And I've had this little thermometer down here for a couple hours now and it's showing 18 Celsius and 45 degrees humidity. Taking a look at the side of the battery, we have our on off power switch. This is going to control the BMS. And then we have a specifications panel, which is riveted in place. And then down in the bottom right, I assume this is a serial number. And this panel does look like it is removable. I see four Phillips screws. So I'm going to assume the BMS is behind here. It is no joke how heavy this thing is at 108 pounds. So taking a very quick look at our user's manual here, it's all very similar stuff that we've seen before. Max continuous charge of 120 amps, a max continuous discharge of 250 amps. The recommended charge is 92 amps and that is a 0.2 C rate. That's fairly standard. Like I said, most everything in here is very generic. You can wire these in series for a maximum of four batteries or a 48 volt system. Actually be a 51.2 nominal voltage system. The battery tabs are not so stubborn, especially for aluminum tab. And I've changed my test setup just a little bit. This is the first time I'll be using it now. Um, it's the same Batrium Watchmon 5 BMS with a Batrium shunt. However, it's now mounted to a piece of plywood. Uh, and I've got some nice, thick, heavy-duty conductors here. These are one aught gauge cables, and they are fine-stranded silicone insulated cables, so they are very flexible. It's perfect for this type of setup where you're constantly moving it around. And additionally, I added a 300 amp fuse here from Current Connected, and I've got my new WZRELB 3000 watt pure sine wave inverter here for testing. We are discharging around 125 amps here, and I've got my phone next to it. And I do see these two numbers are very close together. So we see 125.2 and 125.6. So they are jumping around a little bit, but they're all within a half an amp of each other. Now the voltage is off by quite a bit. We have 1301 and 1279. So that is throwing off the power a little bit. All right, so our test concluded at 458.5 amp hours. So we are just a hair short of that 460 amp hour rating. Additionally, I was not able to get the BMS in this battery to trip like I typically do with these tests. Um, the disconnect, the low voltage disconnect in my inverter kept shutting down the test first. And that's simply due to the way this BMS is programmed. It's programmed for a disconnect voltage of 2.2 volts per cell. We'll take a look at the BMS parameters here shortly. And one thing I wanted to add there is the reason for the voltage difference is typically that the BMS is measuring uh, the voltage of the battery before the BMS circuitry, before the FETs or the transistors whereas the Batrium shunt is measuring it after all of the BMS circuitry and the cabling, which is about two feet, all of that stuff is going to have some sort of resistance, thus a small drop in voltage. And this is specifically the reason why we test our batteries in terms of amp hours instead of watt hours. 
So there is our BMS and it does look like it might be a JBD BMS. I can't be certain just yet. Oh, there are a lot of exposed conductors under there. Let me uh, reposition this and see what the safest way to. All right, so let's unpack what we see here because there's a lot of stuff going on in this battery. So the negative side coming off of the BMS, we have three uh, six gauge silicone insulated wires. That's a 200 degrees Celsius insulation rating. We have three of those. Uh, and then we have three wires of the same size going from the BMS to the negative post of the battery. Positive is a single wire here going from the positive terminal of the battery to the positive outward post. And this is a number one or a one gauge uh, sized conductor, silicone insulated as well. We then have a smaller size positive and negative coming off of the main battery terminals. This is after the BMS. Those are going up to the connector that went to the front switch. Uh, these two wires are going to be powering the LED that lights up when you turn it on. The other two conductors that come off of here, they're sort of spliced halfway here to control the switch. There's two white leads in this heat shrink that go down into the BMS. That's simply the on off switch. Moving over to the battery more, we have our balance leads, which are crimped on ring terminals with heat shrink. They are screwed down to the bus bars and they are held with some sort of Loctite uh, it's like a hard rubber glue. And all of these leads are going to be our balance leads. So we have our main negative. We have B1, B2, B3, and B4, or the main positive. Something I do like seeing that I've complained about their batteries in the past is the use of rigid solid bus bars. So I do very much appreciate seeing that these bus bars now have humps in the middle to allow for expansion and contraction. So if for whatever reason these batteries were to bulge a little bit or bloat outward, uh, so with that slight hump in the middle, it allows just a tiny bit of movement to reduce the amount of tension or force being exerted to the posts of the batteries. Speaking of the battery posts, these are flange nuts. I don't know if they're serrated or not. And there's a nylon washer on the thread, so they are locking. And they do have individual marks on them. Uh, indicating that somebody has either done a quality check or they could be torque marks that they have been torqued down to spec. All of that is good to see as well. There's absolutely nothing that stands out as a negative to me here. Now we have these two metal bars that are holding the battery pack into place. There are holes cut in for the vents, so the vents are not obstructed. That's great to see as well. And there were some thick pieces of foam on here that were holding them down. Now on the main negative and positive terminals here, it does look like somebody really I don't know if over tighten these or just the way they tighten them down did bend the aluminum a little bit. Um, they simply didn't hold the bus bar like they probably should have when they tightened it down. You know, not the best craftsmanship, not the best work that's been done here. Uh, but again, it's nothing that's electrically bad and none of the actual cells are damaged. So I've now removed the support bar from the left hand side here so we can take a closer look at the cells. And based on the QR code here, the QR code starts with 04Q, which is an indicator of EVE brand cells. And we see these are LF230. Now, interestingly, some of the QR codes do look darker than the others. Um, you can see how that one's a little bit darker. Uh, and this one is just sort of edged off a little bit on the right. So I don't know if that's because the foam was pressing against them. Foam on the bottom of the strips, you can see it's indented a little bit there where the QR code is. And they do appear to be genuine cells as far as I can tell. All right, so I did get the bus bars off of this cell here, but uh, I don't think they're glued in, but there is some neoprene or similar foam in between the cells, which kind of has that gluing effect to holding them together. The cells do have these posts laser welded to them. They appear to be the standard EVE cells here. In addition to the foam between the cells, we've got epoxy board on all sides here. You can see the epoxy board goes the whole way around. And this case is welded on all sides here. See top right, the uh, bottom is welded and the left here is welded. So there's no way to actually remove these cells unless you were to tip this on its side and slide the entire pack would essentially have to come out the top. And here's just a closer look at the aluminum bus bar. It is plenty thick, I believe. This is rated for 250 amps, and I think there is plenty of material here. Taking a closer look at this BMS, we can see it is a JBD BMS. The model number is up top here. It says JBD-SP04S060. 
And that corresponds with the label here on the right where it says V1.2. This does appear to have RS-45 and CAN communications according to that sticker. I don't know how you would use that personally. On the input side here, we can see SW is for our switch. There are some labeled RS-45 and CAN if you want to use those. Moving up here, we have our temperature sensors, which we haven't talked about yet. We have our UART, which is going to the Bluetooth module down below. And then we have our balance leads coming in the top. The Bluetooth module is down below here. It is both glued and strap taped to the bottom of the case. And we can see one of the two temperature sensors is actually affixed to the Bluetooth module. Uh, but there is a second one and the second one is positioned right here on the top. We can see our second temperature sensor. So that's about all there is to see in here that I can think of. I'm not going to take the BMS apart. We've seen plenty of BMSs, especially JBD BMSs at this point. A uh, quick correction here in that the second temperature sensor was actually glued down left of the Bluetooth module. It was not glued to the Bluetooth module like I thought it was. All right, so we are charging here at 3.7 amps. I'm just gonna spray a bit of computer duster here on the temperature sensor and make sure our low temperature charge protection is working as expected. And that was approximately six seconds and you can see it has shut down our test. So the low temperature charge protection in this battery does work. So next, let's take a quick look at the Bluetooth app. Now it does include this card here that suggests using the, the uh, Ziozing electric app on your phone and it shows you how to download it here. I personally went and downloaded the Overkill Solar app, which works for JBD BMSs as well. And I think that gives a much better feel. Uh, but here's a look at the app. You can see the batteries at 2%. We did discharge it for our capacity test. So there's the three temperature sensors. We have the two that we showed. And then there is a third one on the heatsink. It's usually on the FET, the transistors underneath of the heatsink. The individual cell voltages, and you can see they are all balanced very well at 2% uh, state of charge. So that's great to see. So we can go over to settings. So we have quite the list here, but of particular interest are the balancing parameters and the protection. It'll begin balancing at 3.3 volts when there is a 15 millivolt differential. You can see balancer is enabled and it is configured to balance at rest. So it's not like some of these BMSs that are programmed only balance when they're charging. And here are the protection parameters. So over temp is 65 degrees Celsius. Charge under temp is zero degrees Celsius. So right at freezing point. Discharge is a little bit more headroom, 75 degrees Celsius over temp and negative 20 degrees Celsius under temp. Individual cell voltage, 3.75 for the charge and 2.2 volts for the undercharge. So this is actually set a bit lower than we typically see. And I think that's why I wasn't able to hit it on my capacity test. You can pull 270 amps for up to 10 seconds before it will trip. 500 amps for 640 milliseconds. And that's about all there is to see here. It's a very standard JBD BMS phone app. So there we go, the 12 volt, 460 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery from Vatrer. This battery tested out pretty good. I especially like the steel heavy duty case. I like the heavy duty handles. We have good terminals. We have a JBD quality brand name BMS, 250 amp max discharge. The cell capacity was a bit unusual. I would have expected EVE cells to test slightly higher than their rated capacity on the first cycle. A 230 amp hour cell, I would have expected to be around 234 to 236. So the fact that we came up two amp hours short with two cells in parallel uh, is a bit of a surprise. The cells do look new to me, but we don't know their history if they sat for a number of months or anything like that. Um, I don't think it'll be a problem for your basic solar energy storage. This battery does sell for $1,400 on both their website and on Amazon. It is a bit cheaper than some of the competition. Lightime has a 460 amp hour battery for $100 more, and that comes in a plastic case. One comment I read a lot when I do these larger battery reviews is somebody says, oh, I can go buy, you know, four or five 100 amp hour batteries and just chain them together, and it's going to be cheaper than buying one of the larger capacities. Well, yes, if you go and purchase five of their 100 amp hour batteries, it is cheaper than buying the 460 amp hour battery. However, what people often forget is now you have to buy all that cable, the lugs, everything to parallel them together. And now you have five BMSs instead of one BMS. There's just five times the point of failure as opposed to just buying one battery. So I do think that has value as well, uh, but we're talking about personal preferences at that point. So yeah, I'd love to hear what you guys think. If you have this battery or any battery from Vatra, please let me know your experience down in the comment section. That's valuable for me to read. And I think it's especially valuable for anybody out there who may be a prospective customer, uh, just to read how their battery is doing and the interactions with the company themselves. As always, please hit that like button before you go and thanks for watching.